Chapter 19, Postpartum Woman at Risk. Okay, so the postpartum woman at risk is in what we call her fourth trimester. She has delivered the baby, and now she has to recover from having a baby. So some of the factors that can place this woman at risk include blood loss, trauma during delivery, infection, and of course fatigue. So the LVN's role is going to be um, in identifying the woman at risk for any kind of complications and ensuring early detection. Of course, the only way we can ensure early detection is through excellent education. So we will be in charge of educating the woman as well. And then, of course, prompt intervention. Early postpartum hemorrhage. So there's many ways that a woman can have um, a postpartum hemorrhage. And when we think about postpartum hemorrhage, you've got to realize that this is going to put her at risk for developing hypovolemia, a system-wide decrease in blood volume from too much blood loss. And if the blood loss continues, the woman may develop hypovolemic shock, which of course is characterized by that weak, thready, rapid pulse, a drop in blood pressure, cool, clammy skin, and changes in her LOC. And of course, we know that this is a very serious complication. So some of the manifestations that can happen with an early postpartum hemorrhage is going to be hemorrhage caused by uterine acne. And so uterine acne is just the inability of that uterus to close back up, to contract effectively. And whenever we're looking at this, we're going to automatically think we need to massage that woman's fundus. So we're going to try and fill that fundus, but often it will be very difficult to palpate. It will be boggy. It won't be tight. It won't be closed down. It won't be like that rubber ball that we talked about. And then, of course, vaginal bleeding, the lochia, it's going to be typ typically moderate to heavy. So she is saturating those perineal pads and having to change them quite frequently. And so that's usually her first sign, our first sign, that she is bleeding out. She's not doing well. We've got to get that hemorrhaging under control. Another way that she can bleed out is hemorrhaging caused by laceration. So she had either a tear or an episiotomy, and she is still bleeding from that. It wasn't sutured upright. It didn't get noticed. But whatever the cause is, she is still bleeding. So you're going to find that the fundus is firm on palpation. It's tight. It is closed off. However, the bleeding is going to be bright red in color. So she's still um, saturating those pads, those perineal pads. However, it's going to be a bright red bleeding, which means fresh bleeding. So we know to look for a laceration somewhere. And when you're looking, you're going to see um, oftentimes pooling of that blood. And then hemorrhage caused by a hematoma. Now this one is not always as obvious. What you'll do is you'll turn her on her side, you'll lift up one of her butt cheeks, and you will see um, a bulge, kind of a bulging swollen mass on that perineum. And sometimes the uh, hematoma is so far back that you can't necessarily see it. It will be hidden in the pelvis. And so one way that we will know that it is a hemorrhage, it, because you will not be seeing the bleeding, the bleeding will not be coming out, she won't be saturating her pads like the other hemorrhages, but one way that you will know that she is bleeding is because she's going to be complaining of this incredible pain that is not touched, is not relieved at all by any medication. Analgesics will not touch this pain. And so, of course, in that sense, you're going to be thinking hematoma automatically. You'll turn her over to the side, see if you can find anything. And like I said, sometimes it will be on the surface and you'll be able to see that bulge, um, that swollen mass, and then other times you will not be. But if she complains of pain that is not um, controlled by narcotics or anything like that, opioids, her pain medications, then you know that there is something more going on there. So the way that we're going to diagnose it will be clinical signs, like I said, that pain, she complains of that pain, and then changes in lab values. If you see your lady's hematocrit decrease by 10%, that is going to be your best indicator of hemorrhaging. A 3 to 4% a decrease is going to be normal with any kind of delivery, but a 10% uh, decrease in the hematocrit is going to be your first sign that she is bleeding somewhere. Okay, so early postpartum hemorrhage, 
Your treatment is going to be for uterine acne bundle massage. You're going to initiate that bundle massage and hopefully you'll be able to get it firm and back in place. However, if not, you will use drug therapy like oxytocin. You'll start that up. Um, treatment for lacerations and hematomas. So with a hemat hemorrhage by caused by a laceration, it is going to recall surgical repairs so the doctor will have to go back in and surgically repair that site put sutures in them ice analgesics all of those things will help um, bring her comfort and kind of get that swelling done but he'll actually have to do surgical repair on that and then for a hematoma again ice and analgesics can kind of often help and that hematoma if it's small enough will dissolve on its own However, if it's too large, they'll have to go in, do a surgical incision, and drainage on it. Okay, so early postpartum hemorrhage, you're going to see uh, the assessment piece of this in your book on page 429. And I want you to read through that. I want you to know what kind of questions you're going to ask. Um, how are you going to assess this woman? How are you going to figure out if she's bleeding, if she's bleeding too much, or if it's the normal kind of bleeding? What kind of signs and symptoms will she display? What kind of questions will you ask about um, her pads and how often she's changing it? And is she saturating those pads? What is her uterus doing? Is it firm? Is it in place? Is it midline? Uh, any look yet? Observing the color, the amount, the odor, the characteristics. When is the last time that woman urinated? Does she need to go urinate? And then, of course, severe pain. Is it relieved with analgesics? Is it not? Um, nursing diagnosis. She will be at risk for uh, deficient fluid volume rela related to that excessive blood loss. So we will be encouraging her to take in a lot of fluids as well as starting IV fluids on her. She is at risk for injury related to the hemorrhage and possible development of hemovolemic, hypovolemic shock. And then ineffective tissue perfusion related to decreased circulating blood. She isn't um, circulating that blood as she should. Instead, it is bleeding out of her and puts her at risk for many things. Signs and symptoms of restored fluid balance, hoping that she'll remain free of injury and exhibit signs of adequate uh, tissue perfusion. So controlling and restoring fluid, bal fluid balance, preventing injury, promoting adequate tissue perfusion, and of course our um, evaluation of our goals, our expected outcomes, we want this woman to start stop bleeding. She has got to exhibit signs of adequate tissue perfusion. She'll remain free of injury and she will maintain her fluid balance. So read through those things and know that very well. Okay, so a late postpartum hemorrhage. Now remember when we talked about the normal blood loss for a woman during a vaginal delivery, we said it could be anywhere from 250, 350 to 500. And then for a C-section, it's going to be 500 mils. Now, what constitutes a late postpartum hemorrhage is that it's blood loss of more than 500 mils occurring after the first 24 hours. So this is after she's had the C-section, after she's delivered the baby, she has a blood loss of 500 mils and it can be anywhere from 24 hours after delivery all the way through the six week period, the six week postpartum period. Now obviously with the six week postpartum period, she is not gonna still be in the hospital. So that's where education is a huge part. We have got to teach her what, what normal bleeding looks like, what, um, how many pads she should be going through in a day, and what that progress, what that normal um, bleeding loss looks like. The serosa rubra alba stage, rubra serosa alba, of course, don't get those backwards, and that she should not go from alba back to rubra bleeding, and if she does, that that is um, a sign that she could be having some sort of hemorrhaging. She should never see increase in bleeding, so we're going to teach her about that. And then her uterus, she should be her uterus should be going down in size every day, one centimeter, one finger breadth per day. You should feel it um, sub-involuting back down to a normal size. And if she's not feeling that, if she can still feel her uterus, she knows that that is not a good sign. By the 10th day, she should not be able to feel it at all. Diagnosis is usually going to be by hemoglobin and hematocrit 
course, the, their levels will be very low. Okay, so treatment, we're focusing on correcting the underlying cause of hemorrhage. What is causing the hemorrhage? Is it placental um, fragments still left in the woman? Or is it just that uterus isn't closing down? Do we need to give her oxytocin? Do we need to bring her back? What are we going to do to get her to stop bleeding? And nursing care is going to be on patient education. Before she ever dis gets discharged from the hospital, she needs to know those expected changes. And of course, dangers and um, signs and symptoms. Postpartum infection, endometriitis. Okay, this is going to be an infection in the uterine lining. So obviously she can't see where this infection is, but what will she be able to look for? Clinical manifestations. Okay, I want you to go back in those first 24 hours. Let's think about this patient who did have a little bit of a fever. She had a fever of 100.4, and we told her, oh, that's normal. Were we specific though? Did we tell her that is normal the first 24 hours? That's normal the first 48 hours? And why I'm bringing this up is because I want you to see that when you are educating your patients, you have got to be very specific because when they leave us, they're no longer able to just ask us questions. They have to know what is normal. They don't have um, our vast knowledge of what's normal. And so everything that we told them, they're going to be holding on to. So did we tell them that a temperature of 100.4 was normal? Or did we say in the first 24 hours that temperature is normal? Normal. Because in this example, this woman will go home and in the third or fourth day, she will start having a raging temperature of 100.4 or more. And she has got to know that that is no longer normal and why that's not normal, that that is a sign of infection. The same thing with her lochia. We told her that it is normal to bleed how much or a certain amount. Did we tell her about serosa or rubra and serosa and alba and how you should never go back from alba to rubra bleeding? We have to be very specific when we're doing our education and when we are teaching our patients so that they know what signs and symptoms they need to be looking at whenever they are um, potentially bleeding. So again, clinical manifestations on this woman, she will be having lochia. It typically increases in amount and it's dark and perlant and foul smelling. So I really hope we taught her that that is not a normal thing and she needs to come back in. Diagnosis is often made by the white blood cell count. It's increased in cephanils and polymorphonuclear leukocytes. And then a urine culture is done and then it's often negative. So we know that it is not a UTI that she is suffering with. Um, most common causes of this endometriitis is going to be uh, retained uh, uterine fragments and then it's just that subuterine involution is not happening. Uterine subinvolution, she is not clamping down, her uterus is not closing off. So um, treatment is going to be a mainstay of antibiotics. Antibiotic therapy, she'll come back in, we'll usually do IV therapy, and then she won't even have to do PO therapy. Sometimes she can do PO therapy, and in that case, we have to make sure that we are educating her on taking the full course, teaching her that she has to take all pills even after she's feeling better, that um, to finish out the therapy. And why do we do that? So that she doesn't develop any kind of uh, resistance, antibiotic resistance to the antibiotics. Um, nursing care is going to be on managing antibiotic therapy, providing comfort measures, alleviating any kind of anxiety, and provi providing that patient teaching. Okay, back to wound infections. Postpartum infection, with the wound infection, uh, there are many risk factors, and I want you to think about um, with all of these women who are suffering with an infection, think of everything that we did to them while they were having this baby. Think about urinary catheterization, episiotomies, lacerations, uh, vaginal exams, the frequency of vaginal exams, retained placentas, prolonged ruptures, chorioamnitis, 
traumatic birth with the use of instruments such as forceps or a vacuum extractor, and then invasive procedures like internal fetal monitoring, fetal scalp sampling, amnio infusion, all of these things are going to put this woman at risk. And one of the other things that we don't typically think about is an emergency C-section. We try and keep everything sterile technique, but sometimes um, for the sake of getting that baby out alive with enough time, uh, sterile technique gets um, a little smudged. So again, just think about everything that puts this woman at risk. And while you're caring for her, make sure that you are doing the things to properly um, decrease those risks to her of infection. Okay, so wound infection, we're thinking about if the woman has a C-section or if she had an episiotomy, something like that. Risk factors include a history of chronic medical disorder. Think about the diabetic patient, insulin, um, high blood sugars will decrease her immune system, so she could be at risk. Anemia, malnutrition, obesity, obesity chorioamnitis, immunosuppression, development of hematoma, prolonged labor, rupture in membranes, operative time, and hemorrhage. So clinical manifestations. Often you'll see pain disproportionate to expectations, pain unrelieved by um, any kind of medications. You'll see redness of the area and edema. And diagnosis will be made with a white blood cell count and then wound or blood cultures. So treatment will be antibiotic therapy. Again, it could be uh, IV therapy. It could also be um, PO therapy. And of course, if it's PO therapy, we are going to teach her to take the full amount. Supportive therapy. How are we going to make sure that she um, knows what she's supposed to do? How is she supposed to care for the wound? How is she supposed to take those antibiotics? Nursing care, warm compress, keeping the area clean, wound care if needed. Mastitis. Okay, this is an infection in the mammary gland. So it's not actually in the patient's milk, it is in the mammary gland. Uh, risk factors you'll read on 436. You'll see inadequate or incomplete breast emptying. So it's leaving the milk stasis. That milk is just staying there. It's not getting fully, um, her breasts are not fully emptying. It could be engorgement, clogged milk, du milk ducts, cracked or bleeding nipples, nipple piercing, and then use of the plastic backed uh, breast pads. It will keep um, those parasites, not parasites, but those uh, organisms inside it and cause um, the organism to go to her breast. If her, her nipples are cracked, then you can see where that infection would be introduced. Oftentimes, the manifestations are going to be very flu-like symptoms that occur suddenly. She feels bad. She has fever. She just doesn't feel good at all. And then diagnosis is often found on signs and symptoms. Um, to prevent this, we are going to encourage her to continue breastfeeding. The MedSearch book says contradicts that, says that they shouldn't um, continue breastfeeding because that organism could be introduced to the baby, but it's in the milk duct. It's not in the actual milk. Uh, we promote breastfeeding because that's going to promote emptying of the um, milk, the breast, and then that will allow her to fill back up, but it'll get that stasis out. And uh, if you don't feel completely comfortable breastfeeding, then we would encourage her to go ahead and pump. Uh, Treatment is going to be supportive care and conduction with, in conjunction with the antibiotic therapy. Nursing care focuses on supporting continued breastfeeding, preventing any kind of milk stasis, which means keep on pumping, and then also administering any kind of or ordered antibiotics. Okay, still on infections, we're thinking about UTIs now. And with UTIs, you're going to talk um, extensively about this in 1410, but I just want to introduce some brief concepts that are um, 
prevalent to the postpartum woman. So whenever you're thinking about the woman, think about all the trauma during birth, the inadequate bladdering, emptying, that, that urinary stasis is there, whether it's because of um, inflammation and she just wasn't able to completely empty. Also, the trauma that took place of the baby pushing up against her urethras, frequent vaginal exams, urinary catheterization, delivery with instrumentation. Again, all of these things are being introduced up into that vaginal area, into the perineum, and can easily cause infection. Um, okay. So clinical manifestations, you are going to see just the different clinical manifestations. Oftentimes it's burning and pain on urination, your uh, urgency and frequency. And a lot of times a woman will stop um, taking in fluids. She doesn't want to take a lot of fluids because she's hurting and therefore she won't have to use the bathroom. However, um, what we have to promote with nursing care is adequate hydration. We need to tell her that she needs at least 3,000 milliliters of fluid a day. And we encourage the um, acidic drinks, the cranberry juice, things like that, because it will make um, acid more, her urine more acidic. We also want to tell her to avoid any kind of carbonation drinks because that will make her urine more alkaline. Um, and then, of course, providing any kind of comfort, giving her pain medications as needed. We'll do the initial broad spectrum antibiotic, and then after um, we get her culture and sensitivity back, we will adjust the antibiotic to fix what matches that better. Venus thromboembolism. Um, okay, so Ms. Sharp will talk about this in 1410 with cardiac. However, we need to address just a few things on it because it is the leading cause of maternal morbidity. So, pretty important. And think about some of the things that go along with being pregnant. Um, the clotting factors are gonna increase during pregnancy and they remain elevated during early postpartum. Pressure of the pregnant uterus on the lower extremity of the veins, it can cause um, pulling down in the legs, uh, vascular trauma during childbirth, prolonged periods in that Latonomy position, just laying down. All of these things are going to put her at risk for um, thromboembolize, deep vein thrombosis, DVTs, swelling and calf pain or tenderness, Homan sign, and then the leg may appear pale or white with diminished pedal pulses. Um, this is part of our bubble heap assessment. Okay, the Homan sign. We don't actually do the Homan sign now, where you actually move the foot up and down because you could dislodge lodge that clot. However, you need to be able to look and um, assess whether or not that pain in her calf or the tenderness is there, redness, anything like that. So we're still looking, but we're not um, doing that actual um, Holman sign where you move it back and forth. Early ambulation is going to help with this as well. We want to get her up. We want to get her moving. So... Diagnosis is going to be that ventilation perfusion scan and then ABGs as well. Uh, treatment, primary goals of medical tr therapy for DVTs are to prevent further thrombo formation and to prevent any kind of pulmonary embolism. So a lot of times we will start them on anticoagulation. Anticoagul With that, it could be Lovenox for um, 10 to 12 days, and then we might even start heparin. After that, they would probably go on to a Coumadin um, treatment and do that for at least six weeks. And remember, we're trying to break that clot down, especially um, if she were at risk for a PE or anything like that. We're going to make sure she's on bed rest. We're going to be applying compression stockings as ordered, elevating the affected extremity to promote venous return. We're going to be removing those venous stockings at least for an hour a day and putting them back on, warm compresses, and then administering anticoagulant anti therapy as ordered. Pulmonary embolism, this is a life-threatening um, disorder. It's very, very serious and often um, very deadly as well. 
it can be um, manifested as in sudden onset of difficulty breathing, pylardic chest pain, and an impending sense of doom or severe apprehension. A lot of times they'll feel like they'll say something along the lines of, I think I'm going to go now, or I don't feel so good. I see Jesus something kind of crazy and outlandish, but it's that impending sense of doom, and it can be very, very scary. Uh, diagnosis is through ventilation, perfusion scan, and ABGs. Oh, going back to DVTs, that's not, that's not the ventilation, perfusion scan. Okay, ventilation, perfusion scan is going to be for pulmonary embolisms. You would do a scan, just a diagnostic scan for the DVT, just to clear that up. Okay, so treatment for PEs are going to be supportive therapy, medications, um, anticoagulation therapy, trying to break that clot up again. And then nursing care, immediately raise that head of the bed, help them to breathe a little bit better. At least 45 degrees, um, begin oxygen therapy, 8 to 10 liters per minute via mask, and then notify the, physi the physician. Postpartum blues, you will see this often following a pregnancy. It's very common. It's not real serious. Um, it's at least 50% of all postpartum women will experience this trans positionary uh, phase of sadness and crying and there's many causative factors stress arising from the pregnancy responsibilities associated with child rearing a sudden decrease in those endorphins with labor abrupt changes in the hormonal levels low serum levels of free uh, tyrotaphine which is associated with psycho psychiatric diagnosis of major depression and then even possible thyroid gland dysfunction Postpartum depre depression is going to be one that lasts a little bit longer. Most common cause um, complication of childbirth, and it will appear within the first six months and continue on. So blues, it won't last six months. Depression, you're going to have it for six months onward or however long until it can be uh, treated. So clinical manifestations of course are just not feeling good, not feeling up to the challenge, and it can be from stress, from trying to raise a child, diagnosis signs and symptoms you will see um, all throughout the book. Uh, signs and symptoms for the basis of diagnosis are going to be depressive symptoms must be present on most days for at least two weeks for the diagnosis to apply, and then often the primary care provider will screen the woman for medical conditions as, such as hypothyroidism, anemia, you know, just feeling down, not feeling good. Sometimes um, that can be the cause of those. So we want to rule that out before ever doing a psychiatric um, disorder. Uh, early detection and treatment are going to be critical because the disorder can disrupt the woman's life and often interferes with relationships. Uh, oftentimes they will just put her on a antidepressant and typically that will help. If the OB doctor feels the need, he will refer her to a psychiatrist so she can get further evaluation and treatment. Um, giving the postpartum woman and their families information regarding this is uh, crucial. We've got to let them know about postpartum blues, which is normal after pregnancy, but if it lasts, if it persists, then it could be depression, and we need to talk to her about that, get her in, because you don't ever want her to be depressed, especially with that baby. You want her to be able to enjoy that. Um, postpartum psychosis. Now, this is completely different. This is going to be a rare psychi uh, psychiatric disorder with severe consequences to the woman, and you will hear um, Bates uh, what was her name? Something Bates. I cannot remember her first name. Uh, this was, her situation was postpartum psychosis. And what happened was she lined up all six of her children and she drowned them in a bathtub um, very methodically and very thought, up, thought out. It was the oldest child to the youngest child um, and uh, put on 
on their bed and she heard voices, she saw, had hallucinations. Someone told her that she had to do this. Voices in her head told her that she had to do this. And oftentimes they'll see it as that there's something wrong with the baby, the baby's deficient, the baby is already dead, and they're just not thinking clearly. This requires specialized psychiatry psychiatric training. She needs to get in. She needs to get psychiatric help at a psychiatric hospital. It's very real, very, very serious and can have serious um, consequences with it. Okay, so special postpartum situations, grief in the postpartum period. We always like to think that everything is um, happy up on the third floor with the babies being delivered and you know the family's happy but a lot of times we can also run into grief and it can be very difficult it can be very difficult for the nurses because they don't know how to handle the grief in this situation and they can feel very um uh inadequate to handle it oftentimes it'll make them kind of hide but we have to be careful about that we have to make sure that we are providing that support for that family as well when a baby dies, depending on the age, if they are um, past 19 weeks, like 19 to 37 weeks, that woman still has to labor that baby. And that can be a very, very hard thing for that woman, that mother to do. Um, but we have to go through those things with her. We have to be very careful. We have to be careful as nurses not to promise her that, oh, it'll be okay, you can have another child sometime. That, that's not helpful in the moment, and it's promising her something that we can't control. So be really careful whenever you're going through um, these things. Uh, sometimes the woman is putting the newborn up for adoption, so there's some grief there. Uh, it could be a woman who um, the newborn had congenital anomalies and wasn't able to make it, or the family whose fetus or newborn has just died. All of those situations have grief involved in them, and so we have to talk through that grief through the family, with the family, allow them to grieve and um, support them in that. And then um, one other topic we want to just address quickly is male attachment in the postpartum period. And you'll see key signs of male attachment. It's when the mother or the father might refer to the child as it. They don't make contact. They don't really want to hold them. And these are all um, warning signs and risk factors that we have to watch out for and make, the, make sure that before that baby goes home, these things have been addressed or we might need to get her in with some counseling, um, social work, something along those lines. Okay, and that takes care of chapter 19.